Welcome, and in this session, we're going to be talking about and reading Matthew chapter 25, one of my favorite portions of Scripture. We're going to be talking about the parable of the ten virgins. We're going to be talking about the parable of the talents, or the parable of the money that you get investing. We're going to be talking about investing here, and we're also going to be talking about the parable of the sheep and the goats. I love this whole passage of Scripture because it talks about how God will judge you. It talks about how God will judge everybody, the people who are going to heaven and the people that are going to hell, and how he judges. So this is very, very important. These are the words in red. Let's start with chapter 25, verse 1 here. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. Now, you need to understand it's very important uh, to be spiritually a virgin, okay? Um, now, the scriptures make it clear. The Lord is like a bridegroom, and his church or his people, those who are joined to him, are is like his wife or his bride, okay? Now, it's also very, very clear here that it's very important to stay pure for the Lord in this spiritual wedding ceremony, okay, in the spiritual wed, okay, that we have here. Ten virgins. Now, this is very, very, very important to understand. These are ten, you can say, people, classifications, categories of virgins. Virgins being those who have stayed pure and holy. So these are the ones who actually, I guess you might say, at least for the most part, have obeyed the guidelines, instructions that God has given them. They have kept themselves pure, kept themselves holy, set apart from the pollution and the filth and the corruption of this world. So in other words, they didn't do anything wrong. They're clean. They're clean. Okay, so the, the, kingdom, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps. Now, again, think about it in this day, you know, in, in, in the context here that it's talking about. They didn't have, uh, you know, electricity in those days. So they took lamps, which would be like oil lamps, um, oil lanterns, oil lamps. And they went out to meet the bridegroom. Okay, here's ten virgins to meet the bridegroom. And again, this is, you got to understand as well that, you know, in the scriptures, there's nothing against one bridegroom having 10 virgins, uh, 10 virgin brides. Okay. In fact, in the Torah, it talks about if you have children by different wives, the, you know, the one, that you, the, the wife that you love and the wife that you don't love, don't, don't favor the wife that you love over the wife that you don't love the, the, the children that is. If they are supposed to be, you know, you got to keep them in order. The firstborn is the firstborn, so to speak. Okay. So, and we also have many instances where we got one man who had, you know, many wives in the scripture. Okay. Now we're talking about scripturally here. Okay. It's the opposite though, when it comes to the scripture, when it comes to women, it, women, it is forbidden for women to have more than one man, more than one man. So uh, if a woman has, uh, had uh, intimacy or was married to more than one one man who is still alive, that's called an adulterer or adulteress. Okay, the adulterer would be the men who are involved, and the adul the adulteress would be the woman who is involved with more than one man who is still alive. Okay, that's just that's just the way it, t it talks about in the scripture. Okay. Um, in context, that is. Okay, we're talking about in context of the Torah, in context, take all of the Gospels, take all of the all of the passages of marriage and, and, and culture and everything, take it all into context, okay? So, nothing wrong here in this situation where you got ten virgins slotted in to marry one bridegroom. It says here in verse 2, five of them were foolish. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Those who were foolish when they took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Why didn't they take oil? Why didn't they take oil? 
obviously, they probably thought that they didn't need it. They probably didn't, they didn't see a need for a lot of oil. They expected the bridegroom to come immediately. I mean, these, these were, maybe they were demanding girls. They were girls who did, doesn't, they, I mean, when it comes to patience, no comprehende. Okay. Uh, when it comes to uh, actually waiting, they don't want to wait. They, they don't even think about waiting. They don't plan on it. Okay. They don't plan on taking a long time. They want to, they, it's just, they just want everything the way they want it, when they want it. Okay. They're foolish. They took their lamps with no oil with them. Took no oil with them. Okay. Probably because they said, ah, we don't need the oil. The bridegroom's coming right away. In fact, the bridegroom said he's coming soon. So he's not going to wait till night. He'll come. I mean, it's morning now. I mean, he, he said he's coming back soon. So obviously, you know, they assume that, you know, they assume that he's coming back before nightfall. They don't need oil for light. Verse four, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Why is that? See, they're humble. The foolish virgins are proud. It's possible to obey all the laws and still be proud. It's possible to obey all the commands of God and still be proud. I know some of you, when I say it's possible to obey all the commands of God, you would say, oh, no, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's perfect, perfect law. Holy law, per, holy and perfect. Nobody's perfect. Nobody can keep all the commands. Read Luke chapter 1, verse 6. They're talking about Ze Zechariah, um, excuse me, Zechariah and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's parents. It says they obeyed all, A-L-L, -L, all the commands of the Lord blamelessly. There's no way you could, you couldn't just, you couldn't point your finger at one single command and say, oh, you forgot that one. No, they obeyed all of it. By the way, it's not that much, considering that they say that in the United States alone, lawyers don't, can't even count how many laws there are. They estimate about 4 million. In the Torah, in the books of Moses, they counted about 300 and, or excuse me, 613, most of which does not apply to the common man. Okay? So... Yeah, it's obey. It, it, it is possible to obey all the commands that 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 apply to you and still be foolish in your pride. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps because they were humble, because they said, "You know what? Yeah, the bridegroom said he's coming soon, but just in case, we are prepared to wait. We're prepared." to submit ourselves to the schedule of the bridegroom no matter how long it takes we're going to have, we're going to take enough oil all of us every you know every one of the wise virgins said we're going to take enough oil to last all night just in case it takes all night that's humble why is, why do i say it's humble because they're willing to wait because they're thinking about what can actually befall them the proud person don't really think about what can actually befall them. Think about, you know, consider the Titanic. How many proud people were on the Titanic and they did not consider the fact that it could sink. Oh, you know, it would never, ever, that, that would never befall us. We're on the unsinkable ship. Too much pride there. It can befall you. Something, you better be prepared. Be prepared. Don't think you're above something that's not all that desirable to happen to you. So, they're humble. The foolish are proud. The wise are humble. The foolish... Don't even think about waiting. Don't even think about preparing for the long haul while the wise think long, long 
you know, in the future, prepare for the long haul. They're ready to wait, ready to submit. Waiting is really an act of submission when you're waiting for somebody. Verse 5. Now the bridegroom de- now while the bridegroom delayed they all slumbered and slept. Huh. They all did. Isn't that interesting now? Yeah, the, all of them. All of the 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 wise, the foolish, they all they all slept. Okay? Verse 6. But at midnight there was a cry. At midnight. Which is you know, you know, um, more or less you'd think it would be the darkest hour in the middle of the night when nobody expected him. At midnight there was a cry. Behold! In other words, look, take notice. Look at this. The bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose. Okay? They all arose. And trimmed their lamps. Now the note here I got says the end of the wick of an oil lamp needs to be cut off periodically to avoid having it become clogged with carbon deposits. The wick height is also adjusted so that the flame burns evenly and gives good light without producing a lot of smoke. Verse 8, the foolish said to the wise... Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. We didn't take enough. But the wise answered and said, What if there isn't enough for us and you? You go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. The wise held the foolish responsible for their own foolishness. They didn't cover up for it. And say, oh, I'm sorry to hear. Here, here, I'll, I'll let my lamp go out. You can have my oil. No, they weren't. They weren't overly stupid nice. They didn't give them any. They held them responsible for their foolishness, which is actually the wise thing to do. Verse 10. While they were away to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast. And the door was shut. (sighs) Shut. Uh, You know, give it a few more, you know, half an hour, an hour later, a few hours later. Afterward, the other virgins came, also came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. They come to the Lord. They call him Lord. They profess him as Lord. Obviously, they believe in him as Lord. But he answered, Most certainly, I tell you, I don't know you. Watch, therefore, for you don't know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Again, He said, you don't know the day or the hour. Again, the phrase, the day or the hour, doesn't necessarily mean the, you know, know, literally a day, literally the hour, like, you know, three o'clock, five o'clock. No, the term hour just means, you know, a, a period of time. You don't know what period of time the Son of Man is coming. But you see, look at this, look back again at verse 12. He said to the foolish ones, Most certainly I tell you, I don't know you. So he didn't know them, they didn't know him. That's why they were that's why they were they were proud. They they suffered, I mean, they you know, they were they always had they were like the underdog that was always the underdog. Like, you know, give us your oil. Open up to us. We always get the worst part of it every day, you know, the deal here. They did get the worst part of it forever. Okay. Now let's read the parable of the talents. Now today we use the word talent to describe an ability or skill. 
Back in those days, a talent was a sum, was a measure of money because they, they weighed silver, gold coins, and they, by weight, is the worth of it, right? There was like, uh, you know, if you have a, a quarter ounce of gold, that's how, you know, that was it. You, you, you buy something for a quarter ounce of gold, you buy something for an ounce of gold, you buy something for a pound. You know, back in then, you know, obviously in that culture, they didn't have ounces and pounds, you know, more like shekels and talents and this kind of stuff. But uh, you see, a talent here in the notes, it says it's about 30 kilograms or 66 pounds. Usually weighed, usually used to weigh silver unless otherwise specified. Okay, so verse 14, for it is like a man going into another country. What's like a, a man going into another country? The kingdom of heaven is like a man going into another country who called his own servants, which is symbolic of the believers, the real true believers, the real true servants of God, and entrusted his goods to them. His goods. We're talking about goods now. To one he gave five talents. Wow, that's five times 30 kilograms. You know, 150 kilograms. That's, that's a lot of goods. Silver, gold, whatever it was. You know, they say it's probably silver here. To another two, you know. To another one each according to his own ability. So you see, I'm just going to stop here for a second. You see the man wasn't unfair to these to his servants. He said, oh, you can do a lot. I'm going to give a lot to you. You, you, you can't do as much. You can only do about half as much as this guy does, or even you know, a quarter as much as this guy does. So I'll, I'll give you a quarter. You know? So everything... The one who had five talents, he didn't have really any more per capita, you know, per se, as the one who had two talents, because the one who had two talents, that was according to his ability. That, that maxed him out. The one who had five talents, that maxed him out. The one who had one talent, that maxed him out. So you see, the man, speaking of God or the Lord, uh, he only expected what was from each person according to their ability, of each one's ability. Okay? Then he went on his journey. Immediately he received, immediately he who received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. He gave it him all. He gave it his all, hundred percent. He maximized his his abilities. Verse seventeen. In the same way, the same way, he also who got the two gained another two. So he did just as much as the first one did, because he worked according to his maximum ability to get double what he got, just like the first one did. So the first one didn't work any harder than the second one because it was he, he has more ability. It's easier for him. Verse 18. But he who received the one talent went away and dug in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Now, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. He who received the five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Behold, I have gained another five talents in addition to them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Enjoy my joy. Come on in. Have a party with me. You know, enjoy my happiness. Feast. Verse 22. He also who, who got the two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Behold, 
I have gained another two talents in addition to them. His Lord said to them, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So he said the same thing. The same thing. Verse 24. He who he also who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man. Huh? Not a very kind thing to say to your Lord. Reaping where you don't sow and gathering where you don't scatter. I was afraid. It's fear. Fear. A lot of people do not do what, what they should do because of fear. A lot of people don't do what God wants them to do because of fear. I was afraid. And I went away and hid your talent in the earth. Behold, you have what is yours. Here, I've kept it safe for you, Lord. Nobody came in and steal it, st stole it. I kept it safe for you. I, everything you gave me, I'll give it back to you exactly as much as you gave me. I gave you exactly what I owe you. Here you go, Lord. But as his Lord answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I don't, didn't sow and gather when I, where I didn't scatter. You ought, therefore, to have deposited my money with the bankers. At my coming, I should have received back my own with interest, at least with interest. Take away, therefore, the talent from him and give it to the one, give it to him who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given, and he will have an abundance. But to him who doesn't have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Verse 30, throw, the, throw out that unprofitable servant. Sounds like trash, doesn't it? Throw out that unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, this whole phrase of outer darkness, weeping and gnashing, and, weeping and gnashing of teeth is re referring to a place most commonly known as hell. The outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, by the way, here's a little here's a little note, a little side note for you guys. If you listen to testimonies of people who have, I mean, in recent years, just in the past decade or so, or maybe in, you know, in the past in within your lifetime, people who have clinically died and have been resuscitated and or resurrected and have come back to talk about it. Those people who, you know, I always say, give it at least 10 minutes. Give it at least 10 minutes of death. You know, cause some people just go, they just go and see the light and then they come back. No, I mean, you go and a lot of people say they go and see the light. Then they, then they talk to the light or the light talks to them and then they go to hell. <laughs> you know, so you'll notice that the people who claim to go to hell, which according to Dr. Maurice Rawlings of California, uh, claims that there are a lot of people who actually die and go to hell and come back to talk about it, but they don't talk about it because nobody wants to talk about going to hell. You know, it's like a child coming home from school with an F on their report card. And you, 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 know, you don't want to talk about it. But those people who do talk about it, there are some who do. It's interesting to know they talk about two different there's two different you might say areas, levels, kinds of hell. Okay? There's the fire which a lot of people experience spiritually speaking. Then there is the darkness which a lot of people experience that too. Some people experience the darkness and not the fire, some people experience the fire and not the darkness. 
Now, I know a lot of you say, well, a lot of you might be thinking, well, you know, this is just hallucinating. You know, they're just they're just seeing this stuff. It's just a bad, bad experience they're having because of brain chemicals in their brain or whatever. Well, explain to me how so many people have claimed to have traveled out of their body and have seen things that nobody else can see. For example, gone to areas of the hospital where it's on, you know, they just cannot go to behind locked doors or, you know, and on, you know, unauthorized areas or on the hospital roof or, or and have seen things that that have been verified immediately after they come back to life and say guess where i was i was over in this room i was up on the roof and this is what i saw oh you, like there's just everybody's just taken aback like how can this is not possible except that it's real you know, people that have gone to other parts of the hospital people who have gone to other rooms where they could they 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 are resuscitated in the hospital room and they wake up and they say, I just came, I was just down the hall here and I heard this so and so saying this about me. How dare you? <gasps> How? What do you mean? You were dead. I mean, you were you were flatlined two minutes ago. How can you say you? I mean, so there are a lot of unexplained things that science, medical science, cannot explain. All they can do is report on it if they. Honestly, make an honest report. <laughs> There's a lot of reports are not honest, of course. A lot of people are not. They're biased, and so they just leave out what they want to leave out. They censor what they want to censor, and they only write down what they think is good to write down. But anyway, so point, the, the, the point that I'm making here is that the phrase outer darkness always talks about like a hell, a hell like place. Okay? Jesus talked a lot about the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him. Wow. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So now he's going to be talking about the, the judgment seat, the throne. The judgment seat of the Son of Man, the throne that he makes the judgments from. Now, before I read verse 32, I'd like to give you another little notice. Notice this. We've been talking a lot about, so far, we've been talking about your production for God, your wisdom, how you produce, how you are profitable to Him. Are you wise? Do you, do you, do you foresee? Do you, are you able to plan for the future? Are you able to, to survive through the night? Are you profitable? Are you strong? Are you humble? Do you take your talents, which really in the in this in this context is actual money, but it, you can also say money. You can say time. You can use anything for you know in that place of talents. Take your talents and invest them wisely. Invest them. Cause them to increase. Cause it to increase. Do something. Do something to grow what God has given you. Okay? So again, you, you look at what Jesus is, 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 is focusing on, highlighting. He is zeroing in on work. Work, okay? Doing stuff. Production. Wisdom. Are you profitable for the Lord? Are you wise? Are you smart? Do you produce? Can you produce? Verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, what a day that will be. That didn't happen, by the way, Mr. Preterist. For those of you who don't know, preterists are these so-called these Christians that 
believe that all of prophecy has already happened. No, the Son of Man did not come in all of his glory. Every eye has not seen yet him coming in his glory and all the holy angels with him to sit on his throne of glory and to judge the nations. He didn't happen yet. It's coming. It's coming. Ha ha. It's coming. You don't think it will? Just maybe about 100 years ago, if you were taught, you know, if you were to tell somebody, hey, you know what? The nation of Israel will come back. It will be reborn in one day. <laughs> Give me a break. How long has it been? The nation of Israel has been completely obliterated, wiped off the map. We don't even know. It's, it's, it, yeah, give, yeah, right. Okay, whatever. It's been a, you know, over a thousand years, almost 2,000 years since we've seen Israel in operation. You tell me it's going to come back? We are living in the days of fulfilled prophecy right now. But this has not happened yet. But it will. Why do I say that? Because it says it here. It says it in the words in red. It says it in the scriptures. It says it everywhere in the scriptures. In Daniel and Isaiah and Mike. It says it through the prophets. It says it even in the Torah. It says it in, the, in, in, the, in the, what they call the extra biblical documents as well. Well, if you're, if, you're, if you're in Ethiopia, it would be in your Bible. You know, such as the uh, Book of Enoch and such. So Jesus is setting the stage here. He's painting a picture here. He said, this is what it's going to be like on the day of judgment when the Son of Man comes back in all of his glory and all of the holy angels with him and he sits down on his throne and he gets ready to judge. Verse 32, before him all the nations will be gathered. What a day that will be. <laughs> what a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, as that, as that song says. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me. Before him all the nations will be gathered. As you can see. And he will separate them one from another. He's going to sort them out. And I'm, I think it's pretty clear here. The angels are going to be doing it too. I mean, the angels are going to be helping him. The angels are going to be doing his works. The angels are going to be going, going through the crowd, the mass of innumerable people, the innumerable people that have lived and have been resurrected and those who are uh, waiting in, in everybody that's ever been alive, billions upon billions upon billions upon billions, as far as the eye can see, he'll be separated. The angels will be separating them, sorting them out. You over here, you over there, you over here, you over there. He will separate them one from another as a sheep separates the sheep from the goats. Verse 33, he will set the sheep on his right hand. That's the symbol of strength and power. Actually, it's more than that. It's actually the symbol of being right. <laughs> that's, where, that's where it comes from. The, uh, the whole, uh, the, term, the word right as in being correct. You're right. The sheep will be right and the goats will be left, the weaker part. The weaker. I mean, in the human body, you would say the left is more closer to the heart, the biological heart. More of a heart, more of the, you know, the feeling, the heart thing, more as the right is the more of the correct, the right. The, you know, what's right? What's left? Think about it. He will put the sheep on his, on his right, the goats on his left, then the king. My friends, think. This is Jesus himself telling you explicitly what is going to happen on the day of judgment, how it's going to happen. 
exactly how it's going to happen. Then the king will tell those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? Why is he saying that? Why? Verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. Huh? The king said that? The king. The most powerful person in the universe. I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me and you treated me like a friend. When everybody else cast me out, you took me in as a friend. More than that, as family. I was naked and you clothed me. You didn't want to expose me. You didn't want to talk about the things that you didn't like about me. You didn't want to say anything evil about me at all. Oops, did I do something? Oops, did I say something? Did I do something wrong? You covered me up. You were loyal. You stuck up for me. You covered me up. When I was naked, you clothed me. You covered up my shame. When I was sick, you, you visited me. I was in prison. Yes, I, the king. The king of the universe was in prison. And you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will answer them, Most certainly, I tell you, because you did it to one of the least of my brothers. The least of my brothers. Not the high and mighty high fluking people that try to make themselves look so great and everything. Their, their pictures are all over the place. Their, their stuff is on TV or all over the, everything. Uh, uh, the, the big names in Christianity. The big name preacher. No. Because you did it. Verse 40, the last half of verse 40. Because you did it. To one of the least. He wasn't concerned about the greatest. He was talking about the least here. Because you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Who? He takes it seriously. Not only does he take it seriously when you mistreat someone or neglect someone that is of small stature, some nobody on the street preaching the true gospel. Some no-name preaching the true word of God. Sure, you got the church on the corner with 10,000 people attending. But you got this guy over here. You say he's an old crazy old man and he only got maybe one friend. Well, he might be one of the least of the brothers of the Lord. Whereas that church of 10,000 may all be going to hell. Verse 41, then he will say to those on the, on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire. Not temporary, not temporary burning and temporary torment. No, 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 no. Eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. Recently, we, see, we saw a volcano erupt on the news. That's just, a little, that's just a little hint of the lake of fire, lava. This is eternal. 
Hmm. <laughs> Verse 42. For I was hungry. Now, this is the reason why he cursed them. And he threw them into eternal fire. Not just a little bit of punishment, a little bit of, you know, punishment. Not just giving them a good swift kick. Not just whipping them. Not what he's talking about. Not just whipping them, beating them. Could have just done that. No. He sent them off into eternal fire. Goodbye forever. Verse 42. For I was hungry. For I was hungry. This is the reason why. It's not because you didn't say the sinner's prayer. It's not because you didn't go to church. It's not because you didn't accept me as your Lord and Savior. It's not because you didn't come forward for the altar call at the evangelistic meeting. It's because I was hungry and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. Naked and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't help you? Lord, if we knew, if we saw you there, for sure we would have been jumped on the occasion. Verse 45, then he will answer them and say, Most certainly I tell you, because you did not do it to one of the least. Underline, highlight, circle, whatever you got to do. Least of these. You didn't do it to me. He took it personally. When the judge of all the universe takes it personally, and you are standing before the judge of the whole universe, and he's got a bone to pick with you, ain't going to be good, buddy. Ain't going to be good. No good news there. He has the power to throw you into eternal fire so that you can be tormented forever. And he doesn't have to answer to anybody. Nobody. He won't and doesn't have to answer to anybody. You better fear God. You better fear God. Next time you see the least... The guy that people hate. The, the, the guy that a lot of people hate. Because he preaches against sin. That preacher that's not much of a preacher because doesn't have any more than just a few people that know him or follow him, whatever else. Whereas the preacher uh, in, the, in the city, he's got, you know, 15,000. You better be careful. Very careful. You treat the least of the brothers of the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about the least of, you know, because he, Jesus is not going to be identifying with the devil, okay? But he's going to be identifying with the real, true people of God. The least. Remember, he said, I live in the highest and also live in the lowest. We can't climb or we can't we can never reach the highest. Doesn't matter how many what size rocket NASA builds is never going to reach the highest. Never. But you can reach the lowest in your heart, in your life. It says the sacrifices of God in Psalm 51 are a broken heart and a contrite spirit, humility. A broken heart and a contrite spirit, O oh God, you will not despise. Verse 46, these will go away into eternal, eternal punishment. 
Doors locked. Throw away the keys. See ya. That's what Jesus is talking about. Oh, but you know, people will get burned up and then they'll be, it'll be all, it'll be, that's the end of their life. No, no, no. Spirit. You can, your, your spirit, your soul, you can feel pain. Your spirit, your soul can feel pain. But it won't be consumed. It will be forever in pain. Forever. Just because you didn't do it to the least of the brothers of the Lord. Last half of 46, but the righteous into eternal life. May every one of you who are in the sound of my voice be included in the eternal life. Take heed and be very careful that you treat that you that you know who the least of his brothers are. It's 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 a lot more than just the little humble little guys that come to your church. A lot more than that. A lot more than that. Look in, you look in scriptures. Who the least were. They were the ones who were really hated, beaten for the Lord because they preached against sin. John the Baptist, beheaded. So anyway, don't forget this. Don't forget this scripture, Matthew chapter 25. Meditate upon it. This is what Jesus said is going to be like with everybody, okay? Okay. Uh, the Roman road of salvation crumbles like a house of cards in the light of the words in red. Okay? In other words, Jesus didn't, he did not say. Let me give you some evidence. Jesus did not say. In that day, when all the nations will come before me, and when I judge them all, I'm going to be asking each one, did you say the sinner's prayer? Did you say, did you accept me as Lord and Savior? Oh, did you know as me and Lord and Savior? Oh, did you did you accept me? Oh, you did. Thank you very much in the entering the door. Oh, you didn't accept me? Okay, go to hell. Oh, you accept me? Oh, that's great. You accepted my, my love and grace. Okay, come on in. It, he made it very clear, very clear, that it will be based upon what you do or do not do. As James said, faith without works is dead. In dead faith will not get you into heaven. <laughs>